Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Glad you're here tonight. Um, Steve, I'm Steve Hagen. I'm President of Mecklenburg Audubon, and Christine has a slideshow, and she's going to run that right now. Unmute. Okay, guys. <clears throat> Welcome. Okay, my screen is not moving. <laughs> That's not good. No, that is not good. Um, there we go. Okay. We'll talk more about this in a, in a bit, but this is the show that we're going to be um, having this evening about our trip to the Sky Islands, but we're going to go through some local stuff before we get going. Um, one thing I wanted to do is remind everybody that the summit he is back on um, our 2021 summit. 20? 21. No, 2020. <laughs> oh, my Lord, it's been so long. All right, the 2020 <laughs> summit is now the 2022 summit. Oh, and yeah. as we're already in fall, spring will be here before we know it. So um, we want everybody to keep these dates. Uh, save the date on your calendar. It's going to be in uh, late April. April 23 and 24, I think, will be the big field trip days. Um, so if anyone um, was volunteering before, we'll reach out to you. But if anyone new would like to volunteer, please talk to us about it. Um, a couple of weekends ago, Mecklenburg Parks did uh, Nature at Night. And um, I just wanted to share with you some of the great pictures we had. We really had a great time. Uh, Steve and Malia and Janet and myself mm -hmm. uh, volunteered and we made owl masks um, with the kids. You know, they all created their own. They had a little template and um, we were the hit of the, of the party. Very popular uh, st stop under our tent and uh, we really had a great time. Uh, we have a few reminders for you uh, today, now that we're heading into um, fall. And one is for the Project Feeder Watch, which is through the Cornell Lab. So um, if any of you are interested in that, um, backyard bird counters, uh, you just do a regular uh, entry two days a week from your yard and they use that data and it's a lot of fun. So they send you some stuff in the mail, some posters and how to's and there's an app or you can do it on your computer, track things. You can check that out at projectfeederwatch.org. All right. We'd like to share pictures from our members when we can. And um, Steve Jenkins is a, a big photographer and often shares his photos with us. So he had a yellow-billed cuckoo of late in the season at um, Chantilly and uh, also the oh my god I'm blanking on the bird he had barred out <laughs> you want to help me out Judy yeah, the Castro's the, the oh were at the um uh at also Chantilly. Chantilly that's what was uh -huh. on Chantilly and the one on the lower right is the um is a rusty blackbird yep. and that was at PD Okay, um, and the Harrier above it, I think, was also PD. Yes, and so is the Bardell. The Bardell was a PD as well. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th these are some shots I'm just sharing. Nothing uh, crazy unusual, but it, it definitely was a changing of the guard last week and a half, maybe. I think it was about a week and a half ago. Um, you know, two and a half weeks ago, I had a Tennessee warbler in my yard and a white-eyed vireo. And then a week later, everything changed. And so the, as we were talking um, about it, the both kinglets have been in my yard and uh, the white birds are singing. And I was fortunate enough to have an early red-breasted nuthatch come back. And I had those um, last year, one that came regularly and stuck around for quite some time through the whole winter. So. Um, 
maybe it's him and I hope he sticks around again. You wanna take this one, Judy? Oh, um, maybe. <laughs> I was looking at the chat. This is from a Huntington Beach. We had a, a really nice uh, trip um, and not lots of different birds, but these are some of the close up ones that we had. Um, the king rail, uh, not the king rail, the clapper rail in the lower right uh, was definitely probably one of the highlights because since you could almost step on it, uh, he was so close. Uh, and wow. of course, the and hangas and other stuff. Then I think the next one is a also Huntington Beach. That's the crowd. That's the group. <laughs> yeah, you got you had a big turnout for this. Yeah, trip. we had a we had uh, I think sixteen or eighteen six eighteen with uh, Ron and I. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, I really like this. This is uh, um, Martin Harrison, who they're new members. Um, and they, she, uh, Peggy, his wife, has fallen in love with this, uh, the spoonbills. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't Harrison. love a spoonbill? Yes. <laughs> Great. Okay. So our uh, backyard birding challenge is, is still going on. And uh, Jeannie is still running away from it with it all. She's uh, really been doing well. Um, and this is the first time I look at the overall stats for all North Carolina um, and saw that, um, you know, not only is Jeannie doing the best out of our um, membership group, she's also tied for fifth in the whole state for her backyard list, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty impressive, 118. Um, Many of the rest of us kind of stagnated, but I would imagine as the new birds are coming in for fall and into the winter season, um, hopefully we'll all get a little boost to our numbers in the, in the upcoming weeks. So thanks to everyone who's participating. I hope you're still getting out there and remembering to eBird and putting it in your North Carolina portal, if you can, for citizen science. And more citizen science, a lot of citizen science in, in tonight's chat. Um, just a reminder that before you know it, Christmas bird counts will be here. Um, and the dates are there on the right and we'll have them up on our website. And we'll also um, I'll post this on Facebook. Um, it doesn't matter if you're new or if you've been doing this forever, this is a, an annual tradition at the end of every year, the beginning of the next. Um, we do a bird census um, in all the key areas around, um, around Charlotte. So I hope you'll consider participating and we'll have the information where you can contact um, each of the compilers who are leading the sections. And the next meeting we will be having Ron Clark field trip leader extraordinaire is going to talk to us about barred owls and all the other owls we might see in the area. So that is Thursday, December 2nd. And it will hopefully be in person. Yes. So we're <laughs> going to do what we can if, if, if things stay steady or hopefully continue to improve. We will be having an in-person meeting. Um, with an option, of course, we're gonna also try to, um, we're gonna work on our tech and we're hoping to have that up so that people who would still like to see it via Zoom or um, whatever online source we use, but I think it'll be Zoom meeting. Um, hopefully you'll have an option to do either or. So we won't be able to have refreshments, unfortunately. Um, and as long as the order is in place, you'll still need to mask. We'll see if anything changes there, but. Mark your calendar and consider your options. Hopefully, we'll be able to do that. All right. Okay, Is thanks, Rick Christine. available? I'd like to officially welcome you all from wherever you are tonight. And I'd like to give a special welcome to our newest members, Jane, Eamor, Jean, Linda, Kate, and Joe. We're glad that you're with us. And if you're interested in becoming a member of Mecklenburg Audubon, it's easy to join our flock. Membership is just $10 for one person or $15 for the whole family. You can go to mechbirds.org, click on the word join on the homepage right above our logo, and you can 
pay your membership dues there. Now, Richard Bocat, our field trip coordinator, will tell us about upcoming bird walks and field trips. Richard. Yeah, can you pull that up, Christine? So we've got some really interesting things happening in November as the leaves come down and the winter species come in. Uh, in addition to walks by Judy and by Ron, uh, we are gonna have two beginner walks uh, the week of uh, uh, the week after next. So on Thursday, the 11th, Janet Palmer is leading a beginner walk. These are open to anybody, but particularly if you feel like you're a little uncomfortable and would like to become a little more comfortable, Janet will be doing one at Chantilly. Maybe that American Kestrel will still be there on the wire. <laughs> and then Marcia Howden will be doing one on uh, Saturday at Atlanta Nature Preserve. Additionally, Steve Tracy, you saw his name for the Gaston Bird Count, will be leaving, leading a walk at uh, Rankin Lake. He said he hopes to see possibly eagles, rusty blackbirds, things like that. Uh, our mm -hmm. own Chris Bowling is going to be leading a walk in, um, at Buffalo Creek Preserve, which is in Cabarrus County. And then Ann Olson is leading a walk at Caldwell Station Creek Greenway. So it's really nice to see some, some, uh, some extra leaders besides putting yes, so much. Thank burden. you to those folks. Yeah. And yes, then, thank you. <laughs> and then also, um, I'm not sure if it's on here, but on uh, Thanksgiving weekend, Taylor Peepoff will be leading a walk yeah. down from Sunset Beach Pier. So any of those, you got the, People that would like to go down to the beach, you can go down and, and uh, spend most of a day with Taylor as he shows you some of his favorite places down at the beach. Can I interject a little bit? Um, if you notice, not, um, you need to keep looking online because we add things. Don't don't rely solely on the newsletter because I <laughs> she's, he's talking. I see there's at least two two. Um, trips that are not in the newsletter that um, right. are now on the website. So make sure you go back there on a regular basis um, and, and see, especially those of you who may not be on uh, MechBirds on the, our listserv, uh, because you, we are constantly adding new um, trips all the time. <clears throat> okay. And don't forget to register. And let us know if you can't go because someone might be on the waiting list who would like to go. That's right. We're trying to lead the, the morning walks. We're trying to limit those to about 12. And uh, we'd like to have, you know, everybody that wants to go able to go. Um, and it, it's really a shame if we have people sign up and then not show up and have people on a waiting list that are at home. So please be um, very courteous about that. So, um, that does it for the walks coming up. And I would like to introduce our own Christine McCluskey and Steve and Diane McCoggin and Malia Klein, who are gonna be doing a program on their trip to Arizona this past summer to the Sky Islands. And I'll let you take it away from there. Okay, I'm gonna key it up for you in just a moment. Okay, can everybody still hear me? Maybe not. Oh yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Sorry, it takes a minute to switch from one screen to the other, so I wanna make sure we're all good. Um, all right, well, welcome everybody. We're happy to have you here and some of our friends who were actually on the trip with us uh, this summer to the Sky Islands. Um, so this all started, um, I was getting very antsy being trapped inside during COVID. <laughs> and so in, um, I think it was May of 2020, I started thinking about how I needed to plan a trip. Even if I couldn't go right away, I needed to at least no, I had something to look forward to in the future. Um, and I had always wanted to return to Arizona. And um, 
but I also knew I wanted to give it a little time for hopefully for things to get better with COVID and the ability to travel. Um, so I started asking around to some of my uh, friends back in New York and my new friends here, my new birding friends here locally in Charlotte um, and some folks that I've traveled with before. And um, so I'm, I'm calling these guys the dream team. These are the people who are brave enough to sign up with me early for this big plan that was a whole 14 months away as we saw the world getting a little crazy and we were just praying that we could get on this trip. Um, and so we went to Arizona um, in late July and that first week of August. Steve's gonna give us a little background. Okay, we were, where were we? We were in Southeastern Arizona and that map on the left has got a little arrow pointing to about where we were. We started in the city of Tucson and our first stop was Saguaro National Park just outside of Tucson. Then we went up into the first Sky Islands we visited. These are the Santa Catalina Mountains and we climbed up to the top of Mount Lemmon. We did it in a van, so it, it was kind of an easy climb, but uh, <laughs> we saw some great stuff. Then we moved south to the next batch of Sky Islands. And these were the Santa Rita Mountains and the famous Madeira Canyon there. And we spent a couple days there. Then we started heading for the border and we made some stops along the way and we visited the border city of Nogales and we got to see the border wall there. Next day, we made our way to Patagonia and we stopped at some very interesting spots there. Patagonia Lake State Park, uh, the world famous Patagonia roadside rest area and the equally famous Patton's Center for Hummingbirds. And now we moved out of there and we went to this desert grassland called Las Cienegas where we saw some rare sparrows and uh, pronghorn antelope up on the hills. From there, we made our way to the town of Sierra Vista for our third set of sky islands. And these were the Huachuca Mountains. And we visited various canyons and mountaintops there for several days. We cut through the old Wild West town of Tombstone where the OK Corral shootout happened. Mm -hmm. and then we made our way up to the final set of sky islands. We visited the Chiricahua Mountains. We started the Chiricahua National Monument. We went over the top of the Chiricahuas to the little village of Portal, Arizona. And based there, we spent several days exploring the lowland deserts. And we actually got into a little bit of uh, New Mexico there. And canyons, mountains, meadows. And then we started making our way back to Tucson. But on the way, we stopped in Wilcox, Arizona, at the Wilcox Palaya. And Diane will talk some more about what happened there. So, and from there we made our way back to Tucson and that was the end of our trip. So that's where we were and some of the places we went and you'll probably hear some of these names as we go along. Okay, when Christine asked about going to Arizona in August, I thought, what, is she crazy? Why, oh why <laughs> would you go to Arizona in August? <laughs> But she had a good reason. So here's why we went to Arizona in August. This map on the left, you can see Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico there. And the colored areas on that map are some of these mountain ranges. And the blue color, although it looks like it should be a lake, is really the highest elevation of those blue areas. And you can see some of those sky islands where we went. And uh, we were in two different deserts on this trip. When we started in Tucson, we were in the Sonoran Desert. And this map on the right has the Sonoran Desert shown in brown. You see it goes up from Mexico into Arizona and a little bit of California. And then we, as we moved toward the east, we got into the Chihuahuan Desert. And that's also in Mexico, some Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. So we visited two different deserts. And next slide, please. These sky islands increase the diversity of all kinds of things you can see. For instance, when we climbed Mount Lemmon, we started in the desert. And you can see in this area that's colored in yellow at the bottom of the mountain, there are little saguaro cactuses there. So you know it's the Sonoran Desert. As we climbed up Mount Lemmon in our van, we 
got into a grassland, then an oak woodland, and we got into a pine and oak forest, and then pine forest, and finally at the top of the mountain, we we're in a spruce fir forest. So it was almost like we got into the van and we drove 3,000 miles due north <laughs> to see these different life zones, but it was really only about 25 miles. So the different climatic conditions, it gets a little cooler as you go up the mountain, it gets a little wetter as you go up the mountain, these different plants show up and different birds show up. So that also helps increase the diversity. There's also convergence in this area of plants and animals from other parts of the continent. When we were at high elevation, we saw Stellar's jays and those you can see in Alaska. We had Eastern bluebirds at the top of one of the canyons. So we had some, the Eastern birds there and Western species like the spotted toey. And of course, there was the Mexican contingent coming up from the South. Okay, why August? It turns out a monsoon develops over this desert in August. Now, when we think of monsoon, we usually think of India. There's this long period of hot, dry weather and the rains come and everyone celebrates. Well, in Southern Arizona, this low pressure system develops and it pulls moist air in from the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of California and the Pacific Ocean. And this uh, moist air reaches these deserts that are really hot, the air rises and you get these flash thunderstorms. And this picture in the upper right shows uh, a monsoon thunderstorm happening in the Sonoran Desert. You can tell because of the Saguaro cactus. So this combination of precipitation, two different types of desert, and these mountain ranges gave us lots of plants and animals. And the the rain also causes like a second spring in the desert. The, uh, the plants begin to flower, the birds have a mini breeding season. And so all these combine to make Arizona in August a really good idea. All right. If you get lucky, right? Which we did. We, we were waiting, they, they cut it a little close, but about two weeks before we were headed there, it, it's the rains came. And, uh, so it really made a big difference. All right, we're gonna each uh, take a few minutes to talk about some of our favorite moments. Uh, Malia's up first. Okay, um, well, I wanna go on record as saying, I don't think Christine was entirely forthcoming about just how hot it would be. <laughs> I would look. I would look up at the thermometer on the van or whatever you call that thing, and it would be 118 degrees. <laughs> and I was like, Christine, what have you gotten me into? But it was, it was fabulous. It was really, really good. So, all right. Well, one of my most memorable moments was our trip up Mount Lemon. You can see there on the left that it's, it's uh, promoted as a must-see Arizona de destination. It sure as heck was. Okay, so Mount Lemmon is a 9,000 plus foot peak named for botanist Sarah Plummer Lemmon. Um, this amazing woman actually talked her new husband into trekking up this beautiful mountain by horse and on foot, get this, on their honeymoon in <laughs> 1881. I've never been able to talk anybody into anything like that. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Um, look how pretty Sarah looked uh, before she uh, took the trick, trip, trek up the mountain. And there is Sarah and poor JG by their tent, uh, you know, mid trip. And they're not looking too good. I think <laughs> Sarah's starting to look like Granny on Beverly Hillbillies, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's uh, definitely aged them a bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, next one, please. Okay, um, so no horses for us. We made our journey up Mount Lemmon, like uh, Steve said. It was 140 years after Sarah. Um, we were on a lovely ribbon of asphalt with air conditioning and uh, the kick and horsepower of our bird or bust van, which we uh, rode in the dust on the back of the, <laughs> uh, the back of the van. Um, so, um, this is a little video of our trek up the mountain. And um, 
I would have shot all of the five life zones that Steve uh, talked about, but honestly, I was so finished doing this video that uh, the other the other five life zones were going to have to wait. But you can see it was really really interesting terrain. Okay, that next. All right, Whew. we made it up to uh, the top and after sweating like sumo wrestlers for a couple of days, um, the town, tiny town of Summerhaven, that's where we, we ended up here. It's near the top of the mountain and it really proved to be heavenly. It reminded me of Lake Tahoe with the, the trees and the, and the temperatures It actually dropped 30 degrees from when we started our climb and um, from two, what it was in Tucson. And those are the feeders that we were headed for, which is right outside Mount Lemon Realty. So we just parked across the street, no hiking for us here, and uh, went over to the feeders. Okay, moving on. All right, so I saw life birds at these feeders at this real estate company everywhere I looked, starting with this acorn woodpecker. And people told me they look like clowns and that was an accurate description. Um, mm -hmm. They drill individual holes in trees to create granaries for storing acorns or other nuts. And each storage tree, this blew me away, can have upwards of 50,000 nuts uh, oh. squirreled away in. And the next uh, life bird for me there was this pygmy nuthatch, which is a tiny energetic songbird about 10 centimeters long. It was just so cute. Next one. So if you're like me and you're used to looking at rose-breasted grosbeaks around here, seeing a black-headed grosbeak for the first time was a bit of a, a shock. Is that a video, Christine? Can we hear a no. song or not? No. Nope. Okay. All right, but it was a very cool bird. Um, and uh, I, I and really liked common. it. Liked we saw it. a lot of those, right? Yeah, we sure did, sure did. Okay, nice we can move on to the next one. Okay, so this uh, yellow-eyed junco, that was another life bird for me. Uh, with those fiery eyes, I think they're a little more evil looking than our dark eyed juncos. Uh, the one, the little one in the inset over there is a juvenile, right, Christine? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. All right. We'll do, we'll take a look at one more, another life bird for me. Um, I love this hepatic tanager. It ref the word hepatic refers to the color of the male, which is a more kind of liver red or a duller shade than the red tanagers that we're used to. So anyway, all that action at those feeders made me want to run up to the realty company, uh, buy a house and live with those beautiful birds forever. That's pretty genius marketing, don't you think? To put Very feeders smart. at your realty office in a beautiful <laughs> place like Mount Lemon. Okay, All right. next. Great. All right. Diane's going to talk a little bit about the Wilcox Playa. That was one of her favorite experiences of the trip. Hmm? Are you muted? Ah, okay. There you go. On the seventh day of our trip, we visited the Wilcox Playa. The Wilcox Playa is a flat, dry desert basin set between several mountain ranges. Water generally evaporates quickly since the average temperature is approximately 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The Wilcox Playa is the largest desert basin of this type in the state of Arizona and covers approximately 50 square miles. And in the picture on the right, you can see an aerial view of the Wilcox Playa. There's a lot of clay and silt there, so it gives it that white appearance. <laughs> Normally a dry alkali lake bed, it becomes a shallow lake after monsoon rains, creating habitat for birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and insects. The playa is well known for its winds and there are large sand dunes around its margins, particularly on the windward east and northeast sides. Other habitats surrounding the playa include grasslands, desert scrub and farm fields. So in the upper left-hand corner, you can see some grassland and one of the shallow lakes 
are ephemeral ponds that form once the monsoon rains start. And below that, you can see some desert scrub, which also surrounds parts of the playa. Okay, next picture. It was not very, we were not there very long before the wind picked up, <laughs> the, sand, the sand started flying and the rain came pouring down, sending us all running for the van. After a short wait, we were able to get out our spotting scopes, binoculars, and cameras and take in the birds. Okay, next picture. Many of the birds, among the many birds we saw that day, were a northern harrier, black neck stilts, American avocets, killdeer, American coots, and several sandpipers, including long billed dowagers, lesser yellow legs, bared sandpipers. Western sandpipers, spotted sandpipers, and least sandpipers. However, my favorite birds were the Wilson sphalaropes. In this picture, you can see uh, American avocets in the back, and there are some about three brown colored birds among and in front of the avocets. Those are the long billed dowagers. Oops, sorry. And over to the left were some phalaropes. But the phalaropes were my favorite. And here's a little video of the phalaropes. The phalaropes have an interesting behavior of moving back and forth and spinning rapidly in the water. Although this behavior is thought to create an upwelling that raises food items to the surface, it reminds me of bathtub toys my children had when they were young. <laughs> <laughs> they are some of my favorites. I just love that spinning. That was yep. so cool. Very dizzying. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the Wilcox Playa was designated a national natural landmark in 1966, but has an interesting history. At one time, it was used as a gunnery range by the U.S. military and is still owned by the Department of Defense and administered by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And in the upper left hand picture, you can see an aerial view of the gunnery target. And below that, you can see a closer picture of this target range. The Wilcox Playa is best known to the public for its wintering population of several thousand sandhill cranes. And you can see a picture of the sandhill cranes in the lower right hand corner. Each January, the city of Wilcox puts on the Wings Over Wilcox Festival to celebrate the cranes and other wildlife in the valley. Less well known is the extraordinary diversity of tiger beetles found at Wilcox Playa, the highest concentration in a single small area in the United States. These beautiful metallic day flying predators abound in the grass and open patches of soil near water and in the uplands around the playa. 17 species of tiger beetles can be found here, including endemic species such as the Wilcox Playa tiger beetle and the Sulphur Springs Williston's tiger beetle. And you can see the Wilcox Playa tiger beetle in the middle top picture and the Williston's tiger beetle just to the right of that. Very cool. All right. All, All right. right. I'm gonna talk about um, the spotted owls that we saw. Uh, we went to a, a campground area and we did some birding one day and it was pretty good. And then the next day we went back there, I think it was the next day because we heard that a sp spotted owl had been uh, seen. And, um, you know, this all this kind of comes through the grapevine. You hear it from other different trip leaders, hear it from other trip leaders because it's um, a threatened species, you're not allowed to put the location on eBird if you see it, because they do not want to have um, any disruptions of this delicate species. Um, and so we went back and we looked, we split up our group of 12 and plus the two leaders, and it's a very small area and we scoured the, the um, trees um, and we had no luck and we were disappointed. Um, and then a few hours later, we ran into another team of birders who were also on a tour who we kept seeing in, in the area. And they told us they had just seen it. 
So we had an option to keep on with our usual itinerary or um, try yet again. And um, we had a unanimous vote. We all uh, decided, yes, we absolutely do want to try again. And boy, we were really glad we did. Um, so those are some pictures there. And um, I wanted to share this little video that we were able to get. We, we did not realize that we would also be seeing a new fledgling, which is just fantastic news for, for threatened species. And just look at that fluff. So he's practicing his uh, branching, he or she. And it was just a, a magnificent sight to see, probably one of the rarer birds I've ever seen. So we were all thrilled with that. That's it for my little story. Steve's going to talk about Subway and the Mexican Jays. <laughs> <laughs> Unmuting here. Okay. An interesting moment came at lunch one day. We visited the Chiricahua National Monument in the Chiricahua Mountains. And this is a unit of the National Park System. It has desert and canyons and standing rocks called hoodoos. And Rich just gave a shout out to hoodoos a few minutes ago. So here's some hoodoos in a different location up in the Chiricahuas. Uh, so after hiking and taking a driving tour of the monument, our leader from the National Natural Selections Company showed up with our lunch from Subway. And we used a couple of picnic tables. We were next to a, fle a free flowing creek. And I tell you, the sound of water in the desert is a real joy. Uh -huh. And I also have to say that that was probably the best Subway sandwich I ever had. I agree. Subway, we ate very well on this trip. Subway was not the norm, but we really were in the middle of nowhere. So that was sort of the best we can do. Um, but it must have had a lot had to do with the location, I guess, because it really was a nice lunch. And you could tell the Jays had uh, tasted Subway before. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as we were eating our Subway lunch, we realized we were being watched. <laughs> there was a whole family of Mexican Jays, and they're hanging around to see if they could get a little Subway too. You know, whenever I'm around Jays or crows or raven, ravens, I get this sense of intelligence behind those black eyes. And this crowd was clearly working out how they convinced this bunch of large, clumsy humans into giving them some Subway. <laughs> this group of jays was mostly birds that hatched this year. First year birds have pink at the corner of their mouths. And you can see a little bit of pink there on their mouths. And this mouth coloration pattern is quite common for young birds because it helps stimulate the parents to fill those mouths with food. Well, it didn't take too long before there were scraps of bread and a stray potato chip or two flying their way. I know this is bad for wildlife and against the law, but these Jays were just so darn convincing. <laughs> Very nice. All right. Malia, you okay. want to tell us about another one of your favorite experiences? Absolutely. And I wanted to, to make an aside that I think one person who refused to relinquish their subway to the Mexican Jays got pooped on. So let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, so I've always been a sucker for a bird stakeout. I remember a couple of days in pouring rain at this condo at Cotswold to see this Western tanager and some other regrettable incidents, but uh, <laughs> this uh, five striped sparrow stakeout in Box Canyon on our, the, our Arizona trip was the mother load of stakeouts for me. It really was. Um, next slide, please. There's our illustrious group perched on that. We were there in that sun on that road for quite some time. But anyway, uh, the bird activity started a little slowly, but there were lots of cool plants to look at, fortunately. Um, the century plant, uh, which is a large evergreen succulent agave, I guess it got its name, and Steve, you can correct me if this is not right. People claim that it bloomed every hundred years, but it really is more like 25 years. Is that is that true? Yeah, that's right. They don't live a hundred years, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, they were mistaken, but it's a cool name for a plant. 
And then the one on the right, the Ocotillo, um, is, uh, is neat. Now, those can live 60 years or more from what I read, and I hope that's true. But if you look at the landscape shot there with us, again, still standing on the road, um, <laughs> you can see there are Ocotillos everywhere all around us. Okay, next. Um, this velvet pod mimosa was another plant that caught my fancy with its gorgeous pink, purpley color. Um, and the Arizona poppy was all over the place, um, just up the hillsides and down the down the valleys. And it was it was really beautiful with its golden golden co um, color. But I don't I don't think it's a source of opium, so it's not really a true poppy <laughs> from what I've read. So. Okay, so here was another uh, life bird who showed up really close and personal. This is a varied bunting, um, and it's the darker billed subspecies that nest specifically in southeastern Arizona. Um, breeding males have a more distinct red hind crown that you can see a little bit on the back of his head, um, and they have this really cool crimson eye ring um, around their eye. Um, we were glad it's, it wasn't shy, um, so we got a lot of good looks. And I think you do have a video of it singing, Christine. So let's listen to that for a minute. Oh, Mr. So I like all that commentary. I believe it was our guide Kim who called him Mr. Mr. Handsome Pants. <laughs> Mr. Handsome Pants. He sure yeah, was. It's so funny bird. to listen to people's reactions. That was cool. Um, and this was another one from that uh, was a life bird for me, a hooded oriole. And I think that oh so black bib is spectacular against the bright orange. I mean, he definitely would have been dressed for Halloween the other night. Really cool bird. Let's see who's coming up. The Finally, star. just when we had almost succumbed to heat stroke on the road in the dust sun, uh, someone spotted our target bird. Oh, there he is, the <laughs> awesomely handsome Five striped sparrow. He's got five stripes on the throat. Three of them are white, and one of them, two are black. Two are black. Right. So, guys, I, I'm not sure how long we hung out on that sizzling as asphalt, but this bad bird was worth every second, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. It was really, really cool, and, and apparently very rare. So we were we felt very lucky to see it. Okay. All right. So uh, Malia mentioned some flowers and uh, Steve's going to talk a little more because they really, you know, I went for the birds, but the, the flowers were the, the icing on the cake. The desert monsoon produces a greening. Saguaro cactus, the icon of the Sonoran Desert, has a very shallow root system and it absorbs as much water as it can after the brief and intense thunderstorms. These large cacti have pleated stems and you can see the pleats because at the tip of each pleat, there are thorns. And when it's dry, the pleats kind of collapse and the thorns are close together. But when the monsoon comes, they absorb water and the pleats expand and the thorns are further apart. There are also a number of scrubby small trees in both the Sonoran and the Chihuahuan Desert. And next, please. Oh, oh sorry, did you go back? I messed up. Yeah, the pollinators. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, the picture on the right, we've got the saguaro in uh, flower. And a lot of animals, including these honeybees, are pollinators for the saguaro. And you see those bees are carrying yellow packs of pollen that they've collected from the saguaro. Just fantastic. Cool. Okay, scrubby small trees. Uh, well, we already mentioned the velipod mimosa and the sweet acacia. Both these plants have lots of thorns and that's a, 
another common theme, spines and thorns on plants in the desert to protect the water they have. And probably the most interesting scrubby little tree, and the, all these trees are in the bean family, was the bird of paradise tree with those bright yellow flowers and red stamens and uh, carpal that are uh, extending out from the yellow petals. It's just a fantastic plant. Now, beside the saguaro, there are lots of other cacti and flower taking advantage of the monsoon. Uh, the tree choyo there in the middle, pin cushion cactus on the right, and the beautiful brown spine prickly pear on the left. There are also a lot of annuals and perennials in flower during the monsoon. We already heard about the Arizona poppy that um, Malia discussed, and it really was everywhere. It was like a signature plant of the desert. And in the upper left, that's a desert marigold. In the lower right, the yellow spine thistle. In the lower left is a plant called puncture weed. And puncture weed makes these fruits that are hard and they've got these spines on it. If you run over with your bicycle, you get a flat tire. And that's how they got to be called puncture weed. Huh. But probably the most interesting one on this page is the Rocky Mountain bee plant. I don't know what you see, but I've got this gray bar right across part of the picture. The you. I'm sorry. And uh, huh? yeah, the, I don't know why this is here. Yeah, it, it just showed up. That's all right. But this one's being pollinated by a couple of large wasps with blue abdomens and reddish orange wings called tarantula hawks. Now, when these, when these wasps are adults, they sip nectar, but they sting tarantulas, lay their eggs on them, bury them in the ground. So when these wasps are young, they spend their life eating tarantula. Wow. Craziness. All right. Well, that was very cool. Thank you, Steve. It really was magnificent. I know um, our guide, who has spent many years leading trips in Arizona, um, she was commenting that uh, that she thought it was perhaps as lush as it had ever been for her. And um, she does lead those summer tours a lot. And I know, I believe the year before we went. The monsoon season was a bust. It never, it never really rained. So that can happen. So we felt very, very fortunate um, to see the beautiful colors and, and all green and flowering stuff. It was really fabulous. All right, so is that bar still there? I apologize. I do have a bar on my screen, but I don't know how to remove it. Do you guys still, is you, do you still have stuff being blocked on the bottom of the screen? Yeah, it's still there, but don't worry about it. Keep going. Yes, yeah, it's, it's okay. fine. We can see what matters. We can yeah. see what matters. Just okay. Good. Our first, um, you know, we were really fortunate in that our, uh, the tour owner is also a guide and he's really into herpetology, amphibians and reptiles. So, while we were doing our usual birding, he also was often on the outskirts and off trail doing some scouting to see what other interesting animals he could find for us. Um, so our, our very first morning in the desert, we went to the Sabino Canyon and um, we saw this patch nose snake and you could see him uh, going into the hole there. And we observed him for a couple minutes and then we moved on and we did all our desert birding. And um, we were shocked when we went back. I think it was Diane who remembered to look again in the same area. When we came back, we discovered this. Um, we were seeing a, a Nat Geo moment live <laughs> and in person. Um, a desert king snake, slightly bigger snake, came along and um, was attempting to eat the Western patch nose snake. And it was this epic battle. Pardon, pardon to those of you who either don't like snakes or maybe a little squeamish with this activity, but it was just phenomenal. I mean, it was really amazing. And um, it, 
you know, we were surprised that it went on for some time and a crowd of people were starting to gather because it was a, a common park, um, not just for out, you know, bird life, but also it was a, a common place for folks to, to walk and hike. Um, so we were all gathering around watching this amazing scene. And uh, we were really quite shocked to see in the upper right corner, you can see at one point the Patrick Day, who I thought would be long gone, um, lifted his head up. He was still alive and he was still putting up quite a fight. Um, towards the end though, it, it seemed pretty apparent that um, the poor patch nose snake was gonna lose. Um, the king snake actually went up. He was swallowing the other snake live and he went up on this little embankment and wrapped his body around some of the um, trees and shrubs on the edge to actually gain leverage and to get more strength and holding on with the back end of his tail to pull, um, to try to pull the other snake out of the hole. It was really something else. So I have lots of video on this, but I'm not gonna share that with you. Um, we eventually had to leave. The battle was still not completely gone, but um, sadly we knew how it was gonna end for the patch nose snake. It really ultimately is not gonna have a chance. So that was the start of snake experience on day one. Um, a few days later, uh, James, the tour leader, also took a few uh, lucky folks from our group um, to go snake hunting on the state line road, which runs between Arizona and um, New Mexico. So you just drive around at dusk and the snakes come out onto the road. And that's myself and Larry there looking at a, I believe it's a prairie rattlesnake. Um, and it's funny, James is on the other side of that photograph, encouraging me to move closer because the snake was very occupied with him because he was down on the ground closer to it. Um, and I told him, that's okay, James, I have zoom on my camera. This is, <laughs> this is funny close for me. Um, at another point, he jumped out of the car, grabbed a snake from the road, and jumped back in the car and put the snake right in my face. I was sitting next to him in the passenger seat. And that was a bit of a start um, before he quickly explained that it was a harmless gopher snake, thank goodness. Uh, so that's the, the pictures you, two pictures you see on, on the left. Um, so here's some more close up pictures of the prairie rattlesnake. We saw three of those that evening. Um, on the left, he's kind of coiled up, James is, uh, has a stick and he's moving them a little closer. The shot in the upper right corner is um, a still from video I took of him moving across the road. And then we also had Western Diamondback rattlesnake. We saw two of those that evening. They have the black and white stripes on the end of their tail. Uh, beautiful. So again, sorry for anyone who is snake phobic, but that was really, really uh, one of my favorite moments. I loved that this trip included not just birds, but lots of other animals and some cool snake experiences. So that's it for our favorite moments. Um, but ultimately, yes, we were there for the birds. And uh, so Malia wants to talk a little bit. We, we had about, this is my eBird list on the left. We had about 156 species um, in our eight day, eight day trip. I think we were there for 10 days, or nine or 10 days altogether. Um, so give or take 156 is about what the group had. Um, Malia, you wanna join in and talk a little bit yeah. about how this was special for you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, I uh, I was probably the newest uh, birder on the trip, including Max, who was Larry's grandson and turned 20 on during our trip. I went birding for the first time on December 17th, 2015 at 830 in the morning with on one of Ron Clark's infamous McDowell Prairie Walks. It was truly a life changing experience. Um, but in the years since, um, I had only birded in the Carolinas and on the space coast of Florida. So going on a Western birding tour was a great chance for me to rack up life birds. If any of you are intimidated by any of this, you know, think, think about how, what a newbie I am and um, 
you know, it was tough to keep up, but it, it was, it was just unbelievably fantastic. So, um, anyway, um, I, um, I got a whole bunch of life birds, probably not as many as Jenny did when she went, but I'll give you the grand total with the drum roll. I got da -da. 80, 87 new 87 life birds. 87 new species on this, uh, on this trip. And uh, we're going to fly through some of the other birds we saw. Um, and all, I counted them up and all, but the two of the ones that Christine has put together for our little parade of birds, uh, only only two of these were not life birds for me. So um, just a fabulous trip. So let's see what we saw. All right. So anybody can interject, uh, uh, Malia, Steve, Diane, if you want. Um, this picture I just had to include, this is my brother's shot uh, of the greater roadrunner sort of the, one of the iconic Arizona birds, but the, the shot on the left, the frontal view with the crest up, awesome. I, I'm very jealous of that shot. It's fantastic. That's the last thing some lizard sees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So Steve, that's your shot there on the right. Yeah, the zone tail hawk. We saw quite a few of them. This one was at Patagonia Lake State Park and just, soared and circle over our heads for a few minutes. It was just an unmatched view. Yeah. And Steve is so great at spotting those because they look like turkey vultures to me. And um, so a lot of times they'd be in with vultures and Steve could pick out a zone tail right off the bat. Yeah, you gotta look for that band on the tail. Um, Larry also got this great shot of the Western Tanager, uh, one of many feeder spots. Um, the, the nice thing about the Arizona, even in the summer, is yes, there, there is a lot of heat, but as um, Steve was talking about the zones, you try to start out in the morning at the hottest spots in the desert, and you work your way up as the day gets hotter, you gain elevation. So hopefully you're trying to keep up and out of the worst of the heat. So we didn't always, you know, it weren't, weren't perfect, but that was the goal and we achieved it most times. <clears throat> but it's not a, a heavy demand hike wise, typically did a lot of feeder watching. There's a lot of people who have backyards that they share and a lot of um, different centers set up visiting. Um, excuse me. So that Western Tanager shot was a nice close up view where we were sitting relaxing and at a, at a, at a feeder station. Uh, these are my shots from the Vermilion Flycatchers. Um, Another one of the, the really cool Arizona birds. This was a family that um, I saw near the airport hotel, actually the, the day before we were leaving and the next morning before I got on my plane. Um, she doesn't get enough credit. She's pretty stunning right there. The, the, that main picture where she just has um, some streaking and a blush of that corally orange underneath. Um, on the right, you'll see the male who's usually more stunning. And this one actually is a little bit faded. They can be more vivid than that. Um, but I really loved that it, um, it, there were three juveniles and there's one sleeping in the sun there. Um, so it was really cool to watch this family unit and watch them. They kind of do the Phoebe thing, you know, fly catcher, obviously they go down and they hunt and they come back to the branches. So that was cool. Malia mentioned Max, uh, the 20 year old, uh, a grandson of a, a friend of mine. I've, I've been birding with Max since he's eight. He was probably the best, other than our guide, he was probably the best ear birder uh, of our group for sure. And, and he's got those young eyes. So, and he also was a good photographer. So um, he caught this shot of the juvenile gambles quail, which was really cool. And, uh, and there's Steve's shot of the adult next to it. This was in the same location, again, in someone's yard at a feeder station. You wanna take this one, Steve? Yeah, this was about a hundred feet from where the epic snake battle was going on. <laughs> and this is a brown crested flycatcher flying out of its nest hole in a saguaro cactus. Cool. It's just gorgeous. Yeah. This so brown crested flycatcher is Pretty similar to our uh, gray crested flycatcher. Mm -hmm. so it, it looks familiar, that's why. 
And speaking of a familiar bird, uh, we had turkeys at uh, the Santa Rita Lodge. And um, this is a subspecies and apparently very rare, almost hunted to extinction, but they are, I think, making a bit of a comeback. Um, but I just love, uh, you can kind of appreciate on the left, they have this um, cool metallic coloring uh, <clears throat> on their feathers. And um, the picture on the right, you can see the under feathers. I love the, the gold colors um, back behind its tail there. Yeah, it was so neat. We were all focused on the hummingbirds there. And the person filling the feeders said that the turkeys are going to come in three, two, one, and boom, they were like a herd of elephants <laughs> <laughs> directly to the feeders. Yeah, absolutely. Um, bridal titmouse, they're one of my favorite little cuties. I think, you know, you see your own birds. So when you see a variation somewhere else, um, you always think it's cooler. And I just love the facial pattern on this bridal titmouse. Well, this was a life bird for me, a Hutton's Vireo. And we saw a couple of them. They're really quite plain Vireos. They've got a little beak and a little bit of an eye ring and some wing bars. But uh, luckily, we had a guide to help us out in situations <laughs> like this. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, this is another one of, of my favorites, uh, maybe because we saw a lot of them. And so we had a lot of um, photographic opportunities. Um, this is the black-throated sparrow, aptly named, but the, those white stripes are just so vivid on that dark gray face. Um, I think they're, they were really cool and, and they had a neat song as well. And um, so they were one of my favorite birds of the trip. Steve, I love the shot, the, the way you got the front and the back end <laughs> of the... <laughs> Well, it's I that suspect. monsoon breeding season brings it on. <laughs> yep, and you can see on the on the left there too. I was able to get some shots of uh, what the net the nest look like. Um, so we did see a lot of nesting still going on as we talked about that second spring. Pyroluxia. Fun to say, difficult to spell. And just like its weird name, it's sort of like a weird cardinal. Mm -hmm. Cardinal on steroids, right? Kind of. <laughs> yep. So the male is on the left. Um, that's a shot that my brother got. And you can see that it has more a red pattern around its face and feet. And then the female on the, on the right-hand side um, is a little, just like ours, a little plainer. But they kind of have that, like a gross beak and a, and a sort of a, a funkier crest, a different looking crest. Young Max got the only shot of the adult elegant trogon. Um, so another iconic bird, it's the only trogon in the, in the US and it's only in that little corner of the world typically. Um, and they breed there. And so we were fortunate enough to catch a pair. Um, the shot on the right is a female and not super clear because it's through the van window. Um, and Max fortunately got that quick shot off of the, of the male on the left. Um, we, did, we heard them calling and then we saw them pretty briefly. I wish we had better longer looks, but we felt, still felt very lucky to see them. I've heard a saying that any day with trogans is a good day. There you go. <laughs> I would have to agree with that for sure. Well, Southeast, Southeast Arizona, hummingbird heaven. Um, there's 16 different species found in the Sky Islands. Um, we saw an awful lot of them, not all of them. We missed a couple that we had hoped for, but there we got a few that we didn't know we would get. Um, we didn't get to photograph them all, but we have a sampling here for you guys. Um, the broad-billed hummingbird, I guess I would say that was the most common. Would you agree, Steve and Malia? I think that's yes. what we saw the most of. Yeah, we saw them everywhere pretty much. Mm -hmm. But Steve, the shot that you have here on the right that you caught, the light hitting it just right, 
is just stunning, really beautiful. Those feathers are just glowing. It's spectacular. Yeah. All right, so here's three other hummingbirds. Um, the Re Rivolis, Rivolis? Mm, I don't know. It's sort of like a pileated, pileated thing, I think. Rivolis, I believe, hummingbird. Um, so there's our there's Steve's little joke. He was magnificent. Um, for those of you who don't know, the, the hummingbird used to be called the magnificent hummingbird. And given that picture that Steve took, I would have to agree. And I think they should have kept the name magnificent. So there you have it. Um, really, really visibly bigger than any of the others. When it yes. came in, you were definitely aware that that's what it was. Yes, for sure. Um, there's a, a, a nice glowing shot of the Anna's hummingbird on, on the top right by Max. And again, you know, it's just amazing how you, the color seems pretty subtle until the light hits it just right. And uh, it was it's so cool to go to these different feeder stations and these famous places where they just have um, an abundance and a variety of hummingbirds and all these different feeders um, set up. So you can just sit. Some places even had little bleachers for you to hang out. And um, that was really cool. Um, on the bottom right, we did get lucky in the same area where we were, uh, where I showed you those spotted owls. Um, Max, Eagle Eye Max spotted um, this little hummingbird nest and a broad-tailed hummingbird was actually um, on the nest, teeny, teeny, tiny. So I believe this, oh no, I was gonna say it was probably through the scope, but it, um, it's Steve's picture. So it probably was just a zoom shot, a tiny bird. Here's another superstar. This was one of our target birds, um, a little, um, certainly rarer, um, the violet-crowned hummingbird, more subtle than some of our other friends, um, but really, really cool mm -hmm. that that bluish purple head was um, really, really pretty. You wanna talk about this one, Steve? Yeah, this is another one that you can usually only find in southeastern Arizona, the blue-throated mountain gem. Uh, used to be called something else. Was it the blue-throated hummingbird, maybe? Yeah, it was just the blue-throated hummingbird. Yeah. Ah, okay. But they changed it to mountain gem because some tropical ones are in the same genus or mountain gems. Mm -hmm. And we had them at a couple of different spots, but they're really quite, quite rare. And uh, the throat, when the light hits it just right, is electric blue. It's it's quite a thing to see. Yeah, that was a cool bird. And I like, this is a name change I kind of like. Pretty name. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for sort of our best of little photography show. As you might imagine, we took a ton of pictures um, and it was nice that we had a lot of photographers in our group and also some photos that we were able to get um, some close-ups of some interesting things. That, that we saw um, elsewhere. So um, I think Malia, I think this is where you have your- uh, My chart. Your, your <laughs> so, so Diane Coggett over there, she's got, if you can't tell, uh, some people call it a crayfish, some uh, crawfish in the South. Um, anyway, when she picked that up and brought it to me and held it out like that, I said, well, Diane, some women try to get a sugar daddy and uh, you got yourself a crawl daddy. What a bump. I love the shot of Diane. I think it really depicts a lot of what our trip was. I mean, um, I, was, I was really pleased with the, the group I was able to put together. We were all into all kinds of nature, um, you know, kid explorers. Um, and we just really had a good time talking about all we saw and learning from our guide who was so knowledgeable about all the flora and fauna and everything about Arizona. So we really thought it was cool. Um, so I just wanted to quickly share with you a few of these other things that we saw, um, just some quick pictures. Um, we did run into some guy who did, who had a light up for some moths and insects to come in one night. So we got to see some of that and, and 
interesting beetles and, and butterflies and all kinds of stuff. Um, bottom right there was a two foot, <laughs> literally two feet long catfish that we found in the teeniest, tiniest pond in the middle of nowhere. Very unexpected to see that guy who I would imagine is quite old to get that big. Um, and here are some other fun creatures we saw. Uh, jackrabbit, the Kawatamundi was the star of the show at the Santa Rita Lodge. Everyone loves when they come to the feeders. Um, lots of cool lizards and rodents. And uh, on the top left, that is a, an ornate desert box turtle. And we found uh, this guy on State Line Road between Arizona and New Mexico. And he was headed across and we stopped the van. And uh, uh, my friend Donna Lee from our group was able to um, escort it, pick it up and escort it safely to the other side. So we were, we were happy to help him cross state lines. That was a fun experience. Okay. Um, yeah, when we asked Diane about her favorite moments, she talked, you know, mentioned that it was more than just the animals. Right. So just as interesting as the birds and the landscapes were the people we traveled with. Kudos to you, Christine, for planning this great adventure and assembling family and friends from New York, along with birders you had met in similar trips. Throw in a few people from North Carolina and you have our group. <laughs> Besides the excitement of seeing new birds, we found and shared many other things in common. Among them were our interest in family, baseball, word games, Native American culture, geology, and rock and roll music, including the Grateful Dead. <laughs> we ate new foods. One of these foods was Sonoran hot dogs served with Yum. bacon and beans, onions, tomatoes, and a variety of condiments, including jalapeno, salsa, avocados, and cilantro. And although they were very good and they were very big, they were not quite as big as the one in the picture there. <laughs> yeah. Um, another new food was raspados, which are literally the coolest drink ever. Nothing tastes better after a day in the desert than a large cup full of ice cream, shaved ice, sweet cream, and fresh fruit such as mangoes, strawberries, and pineapples. Experiencing these Southwestern delicacies with the group made them even more enjoyable. And it was just a great group of people and they were all fun to be with and exciting and we got to know each other and we shared good things like teaching each other how to take pictures on our phones through the through the spotting scopes and um, showing each other birds when we couldn't find when somebody couldn't find one in the bush. So it was really a, a fun group of people. Kim, our guide, taught Max to produce fire using a bow, sticks, and tinder in celebration of his birthday. We were awed by Jane's knowledge of reptiles and Kim's knowledge of everything Southwestern from the birds, their songs and habitats, to botany and Native American history and lore. We all made new friends making Arizona in August an unforgettable trip. Uh, thank you, here, Diane. Here. Here, here. I think you summed that up very well, very well. I appreciate it. I'm glad everybody was able to come. Um, I just wanted to quickly pop this slide up so you guys could see. Um, that's James uh, standing there with me uh, on the left. He, James Adams is the owner and uh, the gentleman who's into herpetology. And um, on the right is Kim Score. She lives in Albuquerque and she's on um, the board there and she's on her Audubon in New Mexico. And so she leads trips in New Mexico and Arizona. Um, Natural Selections Tours was the name of uh, the company we used. And that's a screenshot of their itinerary. They're offering that trip, continue to offer that trip if anyone's interested or wants to learn more about our itinerary for their own planning, um, you could check it out at their website. Um, they don't, it's, it's just a small company. It's just James and a, 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 I think two guides that he works with regularly. So um, you could check out their other offerings and they do a lot of stuff catering to photography. And, um, and in fact, 
not on their website yet, but they just added uh, black bear viewing um, just outside the Outer Banks and the Inner Banks by Lake Madame Mesquite. Um, so I was able to do that uh, in early October and um, they have set up a safe zone for black bears and you can get really um, close for photography and it was an amazing experience. So anyway, we, we really appreciate um, working with, with these guys and, and we recommend them highly. And um, that's it. That's we thank you for, for hearing us out. I see a lot of chat. I've been unable to glance at it while I'm sharing my screen, but um, I'll stop sharing in a moment and we can take questions and comments. Thank you, Christine. We really, really appreciated the whole year's work you put into this. And I think a lot of the comments were just people saying how much they enjoyed it. Cool. I'm glad to hear it. It, it was really, uh, really special. So I was, I was happy with that. So we can unmute folks if anybody has any questions or do we, is there any, I don't know if anyone can help us out in reviewing if anyone had any questions. There weren't any questions in the chat, but I okay. think there might be some other questions out there. Sure. How about now? Anybody have any questions for us about the trip or comments? And uh, um, I know, Malia, you said you got 80, 80, what'd you say? 89? 87, 87, 87, yeah. 87. How about you, Christine and Steve? How many did you guys get? I had five. Steve had one. <laughs> I had I eight. Eight. Oh, no, wait, I did have more than that. I take that back. I might have had, mm, now I don't remember. I might have had <laughs> eight or nine. Yeah. Cool. I have to double check it. I had done Arizona in the spring, but I'd never gone back in the summer. Um, and, and it was also, it was only my second time there, but I have birded um, in, in Texas and other areas that would have some of the uh, similar birds. But I, I I thought it was a neat experience going in the summer. Cool, I'm glad you got some, that's awesome. <laughs> hey, Christine, how about introducing some of the people that went on the trip that didn't speak tonight? They are on sure. Zoom. Sure, sure. So um, Janice, she doesn't have her photo up, but Janice George is on the call. And hey, she's, someone, she's someone I met um, when I did a birding trip to Australia with family and friends, and she was brave enough to join the tour group as a single. And uh, we all became fast friends and have been traveling with Janice since. So she lives up in Rochester, New York, up in Chile, Chile, Rachata. We've got Larry on the call. I see Larry Trachtenberg from New York. He's from, uh, we lived in the same hometown when I lived back in, in Westchester County. It's good to see you, Larry. And Kathy. Hey, <laughs> Kathy is my sister-in-law. She's waving down there. And there's Matt, my brother. Hey. Hello. <laughs> so um, Matt and Kath are the original birders in my family. Uh, they were the ones who have been into it and, and doing traveling for birding for many, many years before I was into it. And I was working in Manhattan and way too busy. And um, when I moved north of the city, and they were coming to visit, I realized I had to entertain them. So I started looking at the local bird watching and that's how I got into it. And I was addicted fast. So, so just like you, Malia, my first big trip was going out to Arizona with Larry. That's where I met Larry first time. And um, oh, oh, well, so that was a really cool experience. I thought I saw Donna Lee on the list too. Yeah, okay, I haven't gone to the second page. Hi, Donna Lee. <laughs> I see her there. That's great. Um, so it's nice to see some of the faces from our trip. Those who were able to call in. <sighs> Anybody else got anything to say? We can open it up. Questions, comments? Have other people been to birding in Arizona from the from the call? I've been there, Christine, uh, but I've only ever been there like in February or December. Oh, so you and, haven't even gone for spring migration either. Well, no, it's been a little too early, but that was going to be my question mm -hmm. is um, I would love to get there like April time frame. Yeah. 
Do you see the same birds in April as you do in July or are, are they different? Um, well, we Steve, went in May and we saw oh, you went in May. Birds. Okay, mm -hmm. for some reason I thought you guys went more midsummer, but you were there May, okay. Oh no, he, we did, we went last week of July into the first week of August. Oh, okay. Yeah. Steve has been we there in May before. before. In May. And um, and I would agree. It's it's. I believe it's most of the same birds, but you ha at that time of year you have a chance for some rarities coming up in in from Mexico and um, because of the rains. I th I think there's there's a chance of some um, a few rarer hum hummingbirds and and some vagrants. Um, that might make appearances that don't always in the spring. I think you have more birds just in terms of numbers, just because uh, they've they've had a few broods by by late summer. Mm -hmm. There's just more individuals around than early summer. Mm. But early summer is nice too. Yeah, I mean, in the spring migration is famous. I mean, that's when most people go. Uh, like Gretchen was saying, April. I mean, the first time I went was in April. And then, then you're appreciating that it's warmer there. And it's not, it, it can get a little hot, but it, not like, <laughs> not like it does in August, I have to admit. Well, I think we saw more on the August trip than we saw on the May trip, but we didn't have a guide when we went the first time. And having a guide makes an amazing difference, especially someone who recognizes the calls and can take you straight to the habitat where mm -hmm. you find that bird. So um, that's something to think about too, if you go is to at least have a guide for, for a portion of the trip, if not all the trip to help you out with some of those more difficult things to, to see. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we, we'd really done a, a lot of research. Um, I was sending out weekly emails to the group, highlighting different birds and all that, but you know, we don't know the in the current intel and where everything's supposed to be and um our guide kim actually joined us on a zoom call before we were headed a few weeks before we were headed out there and she had come from new mexico into arizona to um scout the whole trip and plan it out and and get up to date on on what was breeding and she even did a slideshow for us and showed us her different findings and what to expect and um, so that was really cool. It was a very educational trip, but in a, in a fun way. I mean, Kim was a lot of fun, but so well-versed in the science about everything the you know, the trees, the plants, the birds, the animals, all that. She was, um, I, I, I highly recommend, um, using her if you can, um, you know, besides, as Diane mentioned, because of the, um, you know, some people like to bird on their own, or maybe it, it's also obviously more expensive to hire a guide, but I think she's on Birding Pal. So you could even hire, go out with her briefly, um, depending on your timing, I, I would look into it. Um, we're, we're thinking about making another trip um, in 2023, uh, reuniting the gang and maybe meeting her in New Mexico for her to show us what, she, what she's got over there. Ooh. The, um, the slide that you had that had like the jackrabbit and stuff like that mm -hmm. there was a the animal in the middle in the top middle what'd you say that was called a kawadamundi it's in the raccoon family is that the one you're talking about so he's, a, yeah. he's like he's like a raccoon he has the tail um but he has a longer snout and um so they call him a Kawadi or a Kawadamundi okay. is his full name. But you 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 can see those in Central America as well. Um, say, that's, that's what he looks like. Somebody that would live there. So that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have a few cool things there. They have ringtail cats as well. We we weren't fortunate enough to see that, um, but I know they have those. Desert skunks are cool too. Very cute. Yeah. yeah, we had a. What kind of skunk did we have, Steve? A, wasn't a regular skunk. It was a. I don't think it was a desert skunk. Some kind of stripe. Look it up. Yeah, some some stripe was in the name, but it was stripe skunk. Yeah, maybe it was just a stripe remember. skunk. But that was cool. We followed, we 
he, he came, we stood still and he wandered all around us eating and foraging like he didn't know we were there and we didn't want him to know we were there. <laughs> um, so that was that was kind of fun. Donnelly yes. says hognose gunk. Hognose, thank you, Donnelly. Yeah. What did you guys do to see the snakes again? So the tour operator, James, is herpetology is his passion. So, and he lives in Honduras. He used to be associated with Pico Benito. I don't know if people have heard of that. That's where I first met him. And that's where he started his tour company um, from Honduras. So he's there part of the time and does a lot of snake work there um, and comes to Arizona frequently. So he knows all the places to go. So he was able to, like I said, he kind of off-roaded it. Like when we were on a trail headed one direction, he would be like deeper into the weeds and, and looking up the shrubs and rocks and things and um, trying to spot stuff for us, which was really cool. But the, the night he took us out was on, it's called State Line Road. And it literally is the road between Arizona and New Mexico. So that's when we were staying at Santa Rita Lodge. So I wanna say maybe it was like 20 minutes from there to get to this road and you just drive up and down the road at, at dusk. And you saw the most amazing sunsets. Awesome. And then, um, so you wait, you wait for dark and he just knew what to look for. And you just wait until, they, I guess they come out to enjoy the heat and the, and the quiet of the road when it, you know, once traffic dies down and it's, there really wasn't, not many people on the road other than us looking for our snakes, which was pretty it's crazy, crazy. But, but cool. Okay, Judy reminded us we need to shut things down pretty soon. Ah, okay, so. anybody else? All right, well, thanks for everyone who attended. And if you know someone that couldn't be here with us, we will put the recording of the presentation tonight up on the website so you can watch at your leisure. And hope you can join us again on December 2nd for our first in-person meeting in a long time. Tavola Senior Center will probably be wearing masks and sorry, no refreshments. It was good to see everybody tonight. Glad you liked it.